optimization tool and now here are the problems that uh, can be solved with that tool. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, there is, this is not going to exhaust all the possibilities. So I think in the, well, I'm not supposed to comment on this until the, uh, the um, competition is over at 6 p.m., but um, I'll say that, that, you know, the more kind of the, the, the more tools, you know, especially if you know partial differential equations, then you can model kind of waves, uh, vibrations. And, um, okay, so. Uh, the company is called Comap. And if you look at the contest, it's called MCM, Math uh, Contest and Modeling. And uh, these are the contest problems this year. So, and again, it's still ongoing. So there's one problem of this sweet spot of a baseball. Uh, second problem has to do with some sort of profiling, geographically profiling uh, the location of a criminal based on the crimes that, that he or she uh, committed. And the last one is, has to do with this um, garbage patch of in the Pacific. So it's kind of interesting. Usually the description of this kind of interdisciplinary problems take, you know, 20 pages. So lots of data, lots of uh, things to, to look at and try to come up, come up with a model that explains. Um, and I think they also refer to a paper here. So Uh, but but uh, what I want to say is that you can look at previous contests here if you're just uh, kind of curious, and you will see lots of um, I mean a wide variety, wide variety. Uh, I think last year there was a one that had to design a you know traffic circle, um, which in the United States is more of a curiosity, right? But in other parts of the world is really crucial that you have uh, efficient dra traffic cir circles. Energy cell phones, I think that's a problem that uh, UCCS team chose last year. It had to design a cell like um, from scratch. Like if, if you have a whole new country that you have to uh, build the infrastructure, do you build uh, landlines or do you just uh, rely on cell phones? Very open-ended questions. There's no wrong answer, and in fact, nobody has been graded on those reports saying this is wrong. <laughs> you know, uh, but a lot of the papers have been are, are um, kind of disregarded because it says presentation doesn't is not appealing. I, you know, there's no there's no sequence of thoughts, right? Or the model is not built well, or something like that, right? So it's. Anyway, so we could. Um, people that have good experience with, com you know, computational tools um, usually have an edge on this competition. So it's as as usual, you know, in in, in real modeling, it's um, that's an essential essential part. So you can you can uh, take a look at this if you want. Okay, so let me um, come back to any questions before we start? Any questions about homework that I turned in? Yeah. Uh, no, thank you for. So I, I uh, pushed it back to, let's see. To next Monday. Um, so there are three problems. It shouldn't take you till Monday, but I figured uh, if you need a little bit of extra time. So I'm sorry. Let me. So okay. So I 
The homework is due Monday. Um, I'll tell you one thing about chapter 4 and chapter 5 are pretty much uh, are, are, can be read uh, lumped together. Um, so, you know, these three problems, you know, I would say if you, if you finish them uh, after Wednesday, maybe we talk a little more on, on Wednesday, then you can start talk, working on, uh, on chapter 5. And on Wednesday we should start talking about chapter 5 as well. Um, <laughs> um, right now I left it the same, yeah. Um, okay. So today I'd like to talk about two um, examples of dynamical systems. Um, we, we started talking about last time a little bit, so let me, um, um, let me remind you what dynamical systems models are. I just want to copy another. So I have two codes here, two new codes. One uh, talking about a continuous system and the other talking about a discrete system, so we'll see what the, difference are, the differences are. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to start with uh, talking about, give you an example of a 2D. Well, 1D we, we saw last time. So it said a uh, 1D model would be a logistic model that usually comes from pop uh, population growth. And um, It says that if I have x as a function of t, it's monitoring the population at time t. Then, um, let's see. So I'm going to put it here in parentheses. The rate of change, the growth rate of the population is has this expression. So it, this is Rx plus or minus, excuse me, minus uh, R over K X squared, right? So this is just a constant. Think about it as a just a, a positive constant A, right? So this. Every time you build a model, you have to kind of take into account certain effects. Uh, in a population growth, there is an intrinsic growth rate. So that's, that's assuming that the bigger the population, the faster it grows. And that applies to, uh, I don't know, bacteria population or, or things that, um, uh, so individuals that don't kind of compete with themselves, it's just kind of um, unrestricted growth. So this is an intrinsic growth rate. So that's the reason for that is if you only look at that effect, so you ignore every other effect, then 
what you see here is you see an exponential growth. Right? And R plays the role of that growth rate. Yeah? So the R is the, um, if you want a sort of a, well, is the ratio between the growth rate and the current population. Okay? So that's, the, that's called the interesting growth rate. But if you have other effects, for instance, if you have a limited environment in which uh, your population kind of lives and, and thrives, um, and you take into account competition between, speci uh, between the same individuals of the same species, um, then there is simplest model is to introduce a term, quadratic term, that comes from product of x with x, right? Uh, and a uh, you know, constant in front of it, meaning that um, the competition kind of inhibits the growth, right? So the growth rate is uh, decreased uh, by at, at a rate proportional to the square of the population size, right? So again, the higher the population, the faster the, I mean, the bigger the uh, effect, the negative effect on the on the growth. Okay. Um, again, this is not the only one, and we'll see we'll see other models. But this is considered to be sort of the next simplest from exponential growth. Okay. So this would be just exponential model. All right, and. Uh, why do we prefer to write it in this form rather than in, like in this form, which is probably, again, more intuitive? The reason we write it in this form is that if you look at the steady states of this uh, population, and we say, you know, what would have, what would the population have to be um, initially so that it stays at that value forever? So that would be a constant solution to this equation. And remember we said that constant solution means the right-hand side has to be equal to zero. So having it as a product is just convenient, okay? Because you can see the right-hand side is zero if x is zero or if x equals k, right? So we saw that in the uh, direction field. We saw that zero and k were the two steady states. So this is steady state if um, the right hand side at x star is zero, right? So for logistic model x1 minus x over k is 0 gives you those two solutions x, x star equals 0 and x star equals k okay uh, not only that but we saw from the direction field we saw that and also from the solutions remember we kind of computed the solutions we could compute the solutions explicitly. And we saw that it, over time, so for x0, uh, excuse me, x of 0, so that's the initial condition, is positive, then uh, x of t approaches this value k as t goes to infinity. When x if the initial condition was not zero but it was negative, then you had quite a negative infinity. Yeah. So this value k has a meaning of, well, in the population uh, dynamics, k is called uh, maximum sustainable population. So 
It's just saying that that environment, you know, in that environment, so with those two effects, um, a population of size less than this value will thrive, but will never will kind of approach that value. And a population that that starts it's overcrowded, you know, with a value that's greater than that, that particular number, it's gonna uh, decrease. It's gonna the the, uh, the competition is is stronger than the actual intrinsic growth, so there's gonna be a decrease. And again, to that value, right? So sustainable. And if you start at that value, you're gonna stay at, at that value. Okay. All right. So. Yeah, population dynamics, right? Yeah. So, in in the in the example that we're going to be talking about, uh, in the next few, I guess, lectures, we're going to see more of the uh, population dynamics than uh, economics, um, like with, like uh, manufacturing, right? Uh, so, so you'll see this word, uh, this term, quite a bit, uh, sustainable population, and that kind of means there is a logistic model underneath, right? Um, so here's, a, here's an example in 2D, competing species model. Um, so I'll write down the system, and then we'll we'll see you know what uh, where it might come from. So I have two variables that I'm tracking over time, and those are population of two different species. So this is population of species one. Um, I'm gonna uh, use blue and fin whales, blue whales versus fin whales. <clears throat> so let's say population of blue whales is X1 and population of fin whales is X2 at time t, at a given time t. Now, obviously this, these numbers are, are, are um, integer, right? So it, there's not, not like a half of, half of a whale. Um, so obviously, as time evolves, you know, you know, more uh, whales are are born, and some, you know, some die. So this this is not going to be a continuous variable, right? But the assumption here is that we're going to be talking about a large period, like hundreds of years, right, thousands of years, and then a large population, right? So there's going to be sort of some sort of an approximation to say that um, over over that large period of time, this, this variables can be considered to be continuous. So when we talk about a rate of change, we can talk about a derivative. And not only that, but we can think about each population has sort of a logistic growth. Right? And again, remember, this is these are kind of the simplest possible. Well, I guess the simplest would be to consider exponential growth. Okay, but uh, for large animals, uh, there's always going to be sort of some sort of over, overcrowding effect. So, so exponential growth works for really tiny, right? Tiny uh, individuals, so population of bacteria or something. Uh, when, when we're talking about uh, large size animals, then we have to have some sort, some sort of um, maximum stable population. So these are sort of the simplest two models, right? The simplest model for population uh, growth. And now, in addition to that, we're going to uh, introduce a com competition effect. So, so right. So this term would be sort of competition between uh, individuals of the same species. But now, if if they both coexist. Then there's going to be some 
um, term that, that inhibits the growth of each population. So that is a negative term to the, to the uh, rate of growth, right? And it's proportional to the number of interactions between the two species. So the product between x1 and x2. Yeah. So does this simple model allow for predators? Or is this? No, this is competition, yes, this is still. Competition yeah. Between two right. Um, we're going to uh, talk about uh, predator, you know, uh, next, I guess. But uh, predator prey, so, so this would be on a, a different model, I mean a different setup. You would have a system uh, where, where there's some sort of intrinsic growth, right, in, in absence of the other species. Then the predator would be some sort of a positive term because prey helps predator grow, right, and the prey would be a negative term because predator kill prey. So. So it's just kind of a different sign here. So it's not, I mean, setting it up is not different, but uh, the dynamics could be quite different. Okay, so here, here we're just going to use um, this one, this simplistic model. And uh, even, the, even the fact that we use the same constants, you know, can be uh, debated, right? So the proportional, con the constant of proportionality here for this competition uh, term, doesn't have to be the same. It could have different ones, right? But when you think about about uh, putting this, uh, matching this with a real with a, with a real system, like let's say in the Pacific, right? I think that's a you know it's, it, it, it's quite a big uh, big issue in uh, um, in, uh, in um, uh, marine biology. Uh, in figuring out how much you know how much fish is in in the ocean, right? Which species are are being in danger? You know, endangered. Should we stop? You know, what do we do? I mean, should we repopulate and so forth? So, so just fitting such models with the real stuff is extremely difficult because the you don't know. Not, I mean, you know nothing about this even this intrinsic growth rate. You know very little about the maximum sustaining population of each pop, of each population, right? You know even a little less about what uh, what uh, the presence of one species does on the other, right? So we really would need data that spans you know hundreds of years to get good fits for these things, right? And we don't have that data. That data, I think, just I mean even now it's hard to collect data, but uh, uh, whatever data is 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 available for the last I don't know fifty hundred years at most. Unless the Eskimos were collecting data in their own way, and we we just don't know how to to interpret that. Um, so so again, what's what's the most important thing is competition species. Uh, competing species is the fact that, that this term is. Is negative, right? So we put negative, and we put alpha to be positive. Okay, so uh, so what do we do with this? Well, first thing that we want to do is we'd like to understand. So the goal is to uh, understand the dynamics of the two species. Uh, depending on on uh, their initial um, populations levels, if you want, so um, x one of zero is x one zero, x two of zero is x two zero. Okay. And um, other things we'd like to do to find out uh, steady states with 
which in this case would be called um, uh, well um, or equilibrium and these are called coexistence states if um, x if x1 star so if I'm going to use this x1 x star to be x1 star x2 star if if um, these things are positive so so very soon we're going to be looking at this phase plane in which we plot x1 versus x2 right and we're going to be tracking initial conditions I mean we're going to start with an initial condition here right so initial population is this much for x1 and this much for x2 and we're going to follow that uh, trajectory um, and in that plane there's going to be special points the steady states for which if I start here I'm going to stay here right for all times um, and they're called coexistence because if if there is a valley here right if there's an equilibrium where both x1 and x2 are positive this means that if you start with that with those two values they're going to stay forever right so we'll, we'll see an example in a minute but again um, there could be a coexistent equilibrium here so this would be x star and there could be other initial conditions that go to this right this would qualify this uh, equilibrium steady state to be you know um, not only coexistence equilibrium but it would be a stable coexistence equilibrium right? it says that I can be you know I don't know for sure the initial population what it is but if it's in the ballpark of this steady state then as time evolves it's gonna just uh, get even closer to those values right now there's actually a possibility that you have you have something that's coexistence equilibrium but it's unstable that is um, well, well we'll see examples of that okay but keep in mind about this being positive it's important to be positive if you have an, if you have an, uh, a stable or, or a, st uh, a steady state or an equilibrium that's for which x2 is zero what does that mean and you have an, and you have an uh, you know it could be stable or unstable right it says that the population x2 is going to go to zero right so that's not coexistence but it's still a steady state, yeah. So, yeah, so coexistence if only if both are strictly positive. Um, okay, so we're going to look at the stability. So, the, um, so a stable equilibrium um, is such that initial conditions uh, that are close to that equilibrium approach that equilibrium uh, excuse me the solution starting at those initial conditions approach so if x of t approaches x star um, for x of zero which is x zero uh, is close to x star okay and we're going to define basically unstable is is an equilibrium that's not stable okay and we'll see how that uh, that can happen all right so um, let's kind of be a little bit more specific for this example for this coexistence uh, equilibrium so let's start with a steady state first A steady state analysis a 
I guess that would be sort of the first uh, thing to look at. Uh, so, in general, let's say I have a system of two equations, but it could be, in general, you know, n equations and n unknowns. So, if I have these two equations, then um, an equilibrium x star solves so let's call it x notice that I'm using capitals uh, capital X to indicate it's a vector of coordinates x1, x2 So this solves the system f1 of x, 1, x2 equals 0. So where you set the right-hand side equal to 0 simultaneously. So I'm going to emphasize this. It's a system saying by, you know, we have to solve both f, the first right-hand side equal to 0, and the second right-hand side equal to 0. Okay, so in the whale problem, in our whale problem, coexistence uh, uh, modeling, excuse me, not coexistence, com uh, competing species model, what's the right hand side, what's the left hand side, or the right hand side, so, so I have dx1 dt equals r1 x1 1 minus x1 over k1 minus alpha x1 x2 and I want to set it, I have to set this equal to 0 and dx2 dt is r2 x2 1 minus x2 over k2 minus alpha x1 x2 so I have to set both equal to zero. So let me use two different colors here. So I'm going to set first one equal to zero in red and the second one equal to zero in blue. And I want to show you this in the plane x1, x2. I want to point, I want to pinpoint the uh, locations where both are, both are equal to zero. Okay. So here's how we do it. Um, we're going to take the first equation and we're going to graph it or, or find the points x1, x2 for which the first equation is satisfied. Right? We're going to use red to, to indicate that. And uh, let's see. How do you solve the first equation? Uh, well, you see x1 is a common factor, so you see that I can factor x1. I get out r1, 1 minus x1 over k1 minus alpha x2 equals 0. Right? And this leads to either x1 equals 0 or R1 minus or R1 1 minus x1 over k1 minus alpha x2 equals 0, right? So what's the first one? x1 equals 0 is the x2 axis. Okay? So any point on the x2 axis makes Uh, we don't know until we figure out the exact, you know, the exact uh, values for R1, K1, and Alpha. 
but it's something like, let's say something like this, right? So this is x1 equals 0, and this is r1, 1 minus x1 over k1 minus alpha, x2 equals 0. Okay. And you do the same thing with the other one. So x2, oh, so, so at this point, this collection of points, we call it to be uh, the null Klein. So let me write this word here. So this is called the null Klein. Corresponding to the first uh, variable. So x1 null Klein, if you want, right? So this is going to be the red null Klein and and uh, the blue no, null Klein. Uh, blue is a blue blue whale, so I don't want to. Let's use green instead. Uh, the green null Klein. is similar, right? So again, unless we, we know the exact values, of this constants, we, we cannot plot, you know, uh, very correctly. But at least the, these are lines, and we know the x-axis and so forth. So, so x, uh, the green outline would be the x2 equals 0. And the other one is something like this, right? Okay, so the question is, what are the uh, equilibria? If you know this in all clients, the equilibrium will be always where the null clients intersect, right? Well, it's where the null clients of different colors intersect. For instance, where, where the green line meets the green line here, that point would not be an equilibrium, right? Because it has to be um, a point that leaves on, on both null clients, null clients of different colors. So. That's why it's 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 uh, useful to use different colors because you can see where those uh, equilibria uh, will appear, and of course on paper this says the the steady states are x one equals zero, x two equals zero. That's that's one of them, right? What's the other? Well could be x1 equals 0 and this thing equals 0, right? But if x, if x1 equals 0 uh, and, and this one has to be 0, well, x1 is 0. So this thing has to be 0. So x2 has to be equal to k2. That means there's no species 1. Well, the equilibrium has to be basically where the species 2 is the maximum sustainable population. And the same if x2 is 0, then x1 is, has to be k1. So this is 1, 2, 3, and the fourth is hopefully where coexistence occurs, right? So this would be solving the r1, 1 minus x1 over k1, minus alpha x2 equals 0, r2, 1 minus x2 over k2, minus alpha x1 equals 0, okay? And it's a system of of two equations with two unknowns. So this is a linear system, actually. So you could actually do it even by hand if the constants would be nice. Okay, and it's not guaranteed that this is always going to be a coexistence equilibrium because. It could actually very well be you have one positive and one negative value, right? I mean, you've solved inner systems before, two by two, and you've gotten positive and, you know, sometimes, um, I mean, they don't have to be positive uh, numbers, right? 
the solution of, the, of, a, of a system of two equations into unknowns. Okay, so let's uh, look at the Wales code here and the numbers will not be very pretty. For instance, alpha is 10 to negative 7. That's pretty much a guess. But the magnitude of it, you know, being so small, it says that, you know, the two species really don't bother each other too much. It's not like one is a predator. Well, no. It just says that the, the, the competition between the, uh, the two species is not affecting the growth unless the size of the population would be, you know, of, of 10 to the, you know, the product would be 10 to the 7 and so forth, right? Uh, let's see, the intrinsic growth rate for the blue whales population is 5%. And 8% uh, is for the fin whales. So I don't know which one's uh, actually bigger anim um, size animal, but possibly the blue whales is larger, right? The smaller the animal, the, the higher the intrinsic growth rate would be. Um, also, the maximum sustained population is 150,000 for blue whales and 400,000 for fin whales, right? Has to say something about the size, I guess. And then, uh, right, so this is the right hand side of that system. All right, so again, if you use MATLAB, then to uh, find the steady states, you just simply say, close your eyes, you know, and say, solve the system F1 equals 0, F2 equals 0, and hope that you get everything, right? Remember, you work simple and symbolic. Well, if you work in symbolic, uh, world, then, then, uh, you always have to be wary a little bit of the of the outputs. So right now I'm just going to define the right hand sides and I'm going to solve it. Okay? And because the system was even, you know, you could do it by hand if you had the time, uh, you can see that you really get the four points. Right? The nothing, nothing, maximum sustained population, zero, zero, maximum sustained population, and then the coexistence. Uh, coexistence equilibrium. Okay, so that would be the steady state analysis if you want. Okay, it's pretty, pretty basic. Um, but the very next thing is to say, well, if I start with an initial population that's not any of those four values, where's the how is you know how is the population uh, the of the two species going to evolve in time? Right? So you have to solve that system of differential equations. And I mentioned last time a little bit about this. So, um, so this would be the steady states. Now the phase portrait, well first of all let's start with the direction field. So direction field of a dynamical system is really can be well see the dynamical system can be can be written as a one single equation or matrix equation if you want or vector equation so we're going to put the um, so x is x1 x2 right and this is a function of time. And f of x is, excuse me, it's a, also a vector f1 if you want of x and f2 of x. Right? The right hand sides. So the phase plane.
is the x1, x2 plane. And when we, what is the direction field in this plane? x1, x2 have to be positive, so we only care about the first quadrant here. Um, so there's going to be basically, just as an illustration here, every point in the plane is going to be associated with a, a direction, and the direction is, so what, what's, the, what's, you know, if I, if I pick this point, and I want to I want to compute the solution of that system and display it here. Then I can do this. I can compute. I can I can measure f1, f2, and then I'm going to get that slope, right? Because remember, dx1 dt is f1, dx2 dt is f2. So unless it's one of them is 0, let's say none of them is 0, both are not 0, then you could get that dx2 over dx1 is, is what? Well, it's the ratio of, D, of the derivative of dx of, of x2 uh, with respect to t and derivative of x1 with respect to t, right? So that's be f2 over f1. So, so it would be, if I, if I were to plot x2 versus x1 at this point, then the slope of that uh, curve, or of the tangent line to that curve, would be the ratio of f2 over f1, right? So that's why every time you, um, direction field is, is displayed like this, okay? You measure f2 and f1. Now, um, we'll see what happens when you are when you happen to be on a null line. So, for instance, if f2 happens to be zero at a point, so this means you are in a, I don't know on the green null line. This means that the, the slope, the direction is going to be horizontal, right? When you are on the null line where f1 equals zero, the the direction is always going to be vertical. Okay, so let's see this. Okay, and I have to say one word about how uh, MATLAB actually displays this vector field. So, of course, we're going to sometimes use p-plane just for convenience, but um, there's kind of a funny syntax here. Um, for instance, if I want to, well, obviously you cannot display direction field for every single point in the plane. So, if you choose uh, the you have to choose the window size, so x, x1, say between 0 and 900,000, uh, x2 between 0 and 600,000, the window size has to capture the steady states, right? If you want to see the whole picture. And then I choose 10 points to, I mean to, to display 10 points by 10 points, so a grid of 100 points. I'm going to see 100 uh, directions. And then uh, Unfortunately, uh, well, I think the easiest one would be to kind of code once again the uh, the right hand sides to, to write the right hand sides and um, preface, preface that by uh, this command mesh grid. So mesh grid basically just prepares those computes those 100 points x1 and x2, and then here it just computes the the the, um, the you know, the two directions, the F1 and F2. And the main command is quiver. Quiver is for, um, you know, for basically plotting the arrows. Um, and you have to display X1, X2, and F1 and F2. Okay? And then you just kind of put the axis here. So let's see what, what this does. Okay, so that's... These are 100 points and the uh, arrows. Now, this is not perfect. Uh, why is it not perfect? Well, first of all, the length of the arrows don't necessarily match with the exact values of the 
of the um, right I mean I think if you if you'd like to display exactly the size of each arrow uh, I think it will look messy I think you have to put like uh, I think zero let's see if zero works yeah see maybe I should clear, clear the figure and redo it here so so this quiver um, you can you can force it to display the vectors with ex their exact lengths but then you don't see much uh, right it could it could get it could get really messy or you could you could ask it to just um, rescale so this is a kind of a rescale automatic rescale so you just see the directions you don't see the magnitudes okay but anyway um, this is the direction field okay and now the next thing to do is as I said to identify the uh, steady state by drawing the null clients so for null clients it's fairly easy just say solve f1 equal to 0 and plot it so and then hold on so and do the same for the second one and uh, I don't think I've used different colors but you can certainly use different colors um, but these are and again it doesn't plot the like x1 equals 0 x2 equals 0 or maybe it did but it doesn't show here right? so from this you, it's hard to see actually uh, more than just the equilibria right you see the equilibrium I mean we knew this is 150,000 we knew that was a 400,000 right and we can figure out we can uh, ask the computer to well actually it did plot right it did compute the, uh, the steady state the coexistent equilibrium but I mean it's hard to say what happens with an initial condition that's not one of those four points right so I make a comment here that if you want to, uh, if you want to see what happens there are two options one is to um, code here for instance one of the OD solvers and just give the initial condition say what happens if I start at 400 I don't know 200,000 and 500,000 right then it's going to compute that by solving the system of equations but it's not too pleasant so that's why uh, P plane is actually much better here um, All right, and when we do p plane, what we see is we see the actual solution starting close to that coexistence equilibrium actually com approach that equilibrium as t goes to infinity. Right? So we call that to be a stable equilibrium. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm going to switch to p plane in a second, but while I'm here, um, there, there are the issues of sensitivity to the parameters. Remember, those values of the parameters, by no means, are set in stone. I mean, there's there, certainly 10 to negative 7 is not by far any uh, anything that you should um, you know bet on. So you can do sensitivity to this parameter alpha, for instance, and um, you know you won't be able to do anything like a direction field. But one thing you can do is you can ask the computer to try to solve, find a steady state for, for as a function of that parameter. And uh, you can see, uh, you know, for instance, with respect to alpha, that's what it is. What do you do with this? Probably the best way is to plot, because otherwise you don't, it doesn't uh, register what, you know, whoops. Oh, I skipped. I'm sorry. I skipped um, a cell. Okay. And um, yeah. And then, then what do you do with those 
a coexistent equilibrium with respect to, to the parameter alpha. Well, so what, is, what does it mean sensitivity to that? I mean, of course, a numerical value, you know, ratio of relative changes could, uh, could be something to do, but I think uh, it's more reasonable to ask, you know, for what value of alpha there's going to be no more coexistence. So, so here, you see, when I solve x1 of alpha, x1 is a function of alpha, I solve it equal to 0, what am I, what am I doing? For x2, alpha equals 0. Right, so I get a value for alpha. What is that? Right, right, this value of alpha. No, so the, this value I obtain it by taking that expression that I found for x1 or x2, or let's say x1, uh, and I set it equal to 0. Right, so, so this means that for this value, the, the fourth equilibrium is going to be kind of stuck on an axis, right? Being on an axis means there's no longer a coexistence, right? So this value, it's, uh, there's no more coexistence. This is, well, this is the value where, where x1, the blue fin, uh, the blue whales uh, would be dis extinct, right? This would be the value for which the fin whales would be extinct. Um, it's probably easiest if you do this, this graph, but again, there's, there's, this is by, uh, by far just the, on, I mean, the only way to do it. So uh, here I just plot x1 as a function of alpha and x2 as a function of alpha, and you should really use different colors, I'm sorry. Um, as a fun, uh, versus alpha, right? So what this what this says is, you know, and you can see what, you know, for what values of alpha, both are above zero. That's that's what it means coexistence. So it's the, it's for these values of alpha and for these values of alpha. So it has to be either too few, uh, like a small competition smaller than this valley or larger than this valley, right? And I think I just fancy way of um, of doing this by, by identifying the points where it's actually um, right? So it's saying that for alpha greater than 5.3 10 to negative 7 the coexistence, you know, there's going to be a coexistence equilibrium, right? And for values, for alpha less than this, it's going to be a coexistence equilibrium. I mean, in essence, what this is is actually solving a system of two inequalities, okay? But not by hand, by, by, by using a computer, okay? Any questions on this? Um, one advice is, is don't necessarily take this as the way to represent your, you know, solution or your report, um, I mean, as far as the graphical, okay? I, you know, the, this is just one way of doing it. Uh, in different problems, it may actually look different, right? But sensitivity is to a parameter is really about, you know, at what, at what point, you know, is that conclusion going to be different? So, in our conclusion was that if I have 10 to negative 7, then there is a, an, a coexistence, right? Well, if, I, if, I, if alpha is not that, but just slightly more, then there is no more uh, coexistence equilibrium, right? So that would be sort of this, the sensitivity. Um, okay, so, so C whales code uh, so this would be uh, stability 
um, done with P plane. I think right now it's P plane eight. Okay, so let me. Um, oops. I thought I had that on. Mm. Uh, didn't I show you people? I showed you people in last time a little bit, right? So somehow it's not on this machine. So let me um, put it back on here. Oops. You don't want to modify this code at all. I just want to call it. Okay, so if you look in the gallery here, there is, I think there is a competing species model already. So, okay, it's using different values, so I'm going to just show you with these values, but you can just change these numbers, right? And call it instead of x, y, call it x1, x2, and so forth. Um, <clears throat> okay, but you can see um, ways of, of doing this. For instance, you can find, um, you can show the null client, it just shows them to you, okay? It's not perfect. It's not going to be perfect. Sometimes it's kind of, you can see this here, it's like an artifact, right? So uh, it's not a perfect um, uh, graphical tool, but you can actually, uh, let's see, you can find equilibrium points. I think I showed you last time. So you can just pinpoint, and it's going to, you have to do it one at a time. And you have to be close to, whoops. Oh, yeah, that's a good example here. Um, is this an equilibrium point? No, because this is the same color uh, lines, right? So this is not a intersection of two null clients, right? So I was hitting that, that and it wasn't giving me because that was, but, but this one is, right? Okay, and uh, let me just say this. So here, uh, the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, we're going to basically in Chapter 5, um, we're going to link this eigenvalues of the Jacobian uh, metrics, the sign of these eigenvalues with the stability properties. So for instance, the fact that both of these are negative says that the, that equilibrium is stable, right? and it's called a sink because everything is kind of sucked into that point. Uh, we didn't really watch what this was, but you can see one is positive, one is negative. So this is not a, a stable equilibrium, right? So it's not a sink. Yeah. Well, it's a saddle point. Basically, it says there's only one direction in which is is, uh, is stable, and all, on all other direction is actually going to be unstable. It looks like a saddle. So let's let's just see a few solutions here. You can see it here. Okay. Now let me say this is not the whale, right? For for the whale problem, you had different values there. You had to put the different values, and then what you would see, you would actually see a sink, you would see a stable equilibrium here, the coexistent equilibrium, right? But again, the tool is the same. Okay? And that's pretty wonderful, right? You solve a system by just clicking. Uh, but this uh, phase portrait, as it's called, contains null clients, several solution curves, right? The equilibrium. So you can you can read a lot of things out of it. You can read the stability properties of the equilibrium. Um, you can also see what happens with certain initial conditions by doing a, key, a keyboard input. So you can say initial value is. Well, let me clear this. So you can you can start with an initial condition that I don't know maybe in this case would be zero point. 4 and um, 0 0.6. 
and um, it wasn't too great because it went forward and backward in time. So you would need to see the um, you need to see what oh you need to see the arrows here to see which direction it goes, right? Or else you could do. Uh, let me let me raise again. You could do. Um, solution direction. It could be just forward in time. It's just a nice graphical interface, um, so you don't have to code any of this. But and then when you compute it, you see you know it starts at that point and it goes towards that equilibrium, right? Meaning this species it goes extinct, right? Okay. So, uh, we'll talk about discrete systems on Wednesday, um, but let me just say that for discrete systems, the only difference is that typically it's not a, grow, a rate of change as a function of the current state, but it's some sort of a discrete change. So it's not instantaneous change, it's like a discrete change. So, so it's a change in the values over some fixed time, for instance, I don't know, a day or a year. Right? It could be a whale population model, but you know the, uh, how the population changes once a year. right? Based on the current state, you know what's going to be a year from today. So if it were the same direction field, what you would see is actually, you would just see starting with the initial condition, whoops, that's a bad example here, but uh, let me just display that. So it has to do with, a, in this case, it's a docking problem, which is kind of interesting. Um, but just to show you the, so imagine that you would have a direction field that's like this. If it's a continuous system, you would fit curves that actually are tangent to this directions, right? Uh, whereas if it is discrete, let's say over one year, let's Im imagine it's a whale problem, right? You would have this initial population, and then a year later it would be this based on this discrete model, right? Now, again, why this big can, when the, the arrow was this small? Well, it turns out that the arrow was this big, but this was a displayed uh, scale down, so you can see the arrows. If you didn't scale down, you would see just a, a forest of, of arrows here, right? But this is a, this is one arrow that initiates at this point, right? Then after a year, it follows this, right? It still follows a direction field, but in a discrete fashion. And you can imagine that it's going to have different behavior, possibly. Okay. Sometimes discrete models are required because of the nature of the problem you're talking about. Sometimes continuous models are good approximations. Okay. So we're good. We have uh, homework that's due a week from today. So, but I would I would get uh, you know I would say get started on the two problems that are continuous, and uh, we'll talk about discrete one on Wednesday. All right. Thanks.